So uh, welcome to the third lecture, of Continuum Mechanics. Let me briefly summarize where we were, what we've done last time. So in the past two lectures, I've done a number of things. I've introduced the vectors. I will still summarize now directly in terms of the summation convention. We always use the orthonormal basis because life looks better for us or it's more convenient in that setting. So um, I can introduce the Kronecker delta ij, um, which is expressed in terms of the orthonormal basis members as such, and immediately implies actually the orthonormality of the basis by the definition of the Kronecker um, delta. So we also introduced the uh, cross product uh, in terms of the basis vectors, EI cross EJ is, in terms of a new symbol, the permutation symbol is EIJKEK. -E so EIJK takes the value of one for ordered and even permutations of IJK, and odd permutations give you minus one. If they are repeated in the C's, then you get a zero. Okay. So that embeds our understanding of a right-handed rule into this expression implicitly. So then we moved on to the concept of um, tensors. And we are really eventually interested in uh, things that are associated with our understanding, understanding of uh, matrices in some sense. And this was my expression. We are interested in a linear operator uh, that can operate on any vector. And we are always interested in uh, real vector spaces in this course. Um, so uh, now, what does A look like? So A, the vector A or vector B is expressed as such, but what I can also do is I can take and put its components into a, um, so I prefer this notation, into an array that has its components A1, A2, etc., going to the dimension of the space. But this really is not the vector because it just refers to the components. The vector is the components, plus the basis, okay? So likewise, I can take the components of this thing and put it into a matrix, A11, A12, but that's just the components. What is the thing itself? The thing itself is the tensor. And a general tensor um, that can apply in a vector uh, that looks like this is expressed, as I said last time, a gen in general as A, I, J, E, I, bon, E, J. Now let's recall a few remarks regarding that. The starting point actually, one step before that, I introduced the tensor or dyadic or bond product. So I said, well, I will introduce a particular tensor, A, bond, B. Now this tensor is such that it has components A, I times B, J, E, I, bond, E, J. So that was for the purpose of um, introducing the bond product. And additionally, I introduced a rule for how such a tensor operates on a vector. Because if I don't know how the operation goes, I cannot use this object. So in, in fact, it turns out any operator is defined by the way it acts on a vector. So now that I will make the definition, I really understand what this thing does to a vector. So I throw in a vector. And now the definition is such that the result is b dot c, so you dot the neighboring vectors, and you leave a by itself. Okay? So this is the definition of how such a tensor acts on a vector. Now this is a particular tensor, though. It looks like this. In general, a tensor looks like this. And not every tensor is such that its component can be expressed in terms of the multiplication of two vectors. So let me just quickly give you an example. Suppose I take a vector E. Suppose I'm expressing everything in terms, of a, in, in terms of a given orthonormal basis, and the components happen to look like in 3D, 1, 2, 3, and the vector B looks like 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3. Okay. So now suppose A is a tensor A bond B, then the components of A fit into a vector, which is now going to be, so A i j is A i times B j, right? So, so for instance, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. They're all 1 multiplications, right? And then 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 3. Um, 
And likewise, let's say 2, 1, 3, 1, 2, 3. The only perhaps component remaining is these two. So that's a 2, 3, 2, 3, 2 over 3. And 3, 2 component, 3, 2. That is the, those are the components of the tensor A, and they fit into a matrix, just like the components of these vectors fit into an array. Okay? The basis is this one, whereas the basis for a vector is just the orthonormal basis vectors themselves. Okay? So what would be a tensor? So this implies that. Now, if I go ahead and make, for instance, this, just mess up this or destroy this nice transition. And let me now make a new matrix. And this matrix has everything the same, except I made this a 5. Now, I haven't verified it, but it's likely that you will not be able to find two vectors whose component delivers you this A through such a transition. In other words, this matrix, or this tensor, with the five modification cannot be put in this form. So this is the general form. Okay, just to give you a little bit of more insight into what these things uh, mean. Um, so uh, also to give you an insight as to how or what this basis means, or how I can sort of understand what it um, uh, looks like, uh, I can also write, for instance, the vector a more explicitly. So a is a1, e1, a2, e2, and so on. So it's 1, e1, plus 2, e2, plus 3, e3. Okay? I wrote the expression explicitly, including the base. So this now is a vector, of course, right? I am including the basis. Um, so now, how does the matrix A look like? Well, or sorry, the tensor A. The tensor A is A11, 1, 1, 1, E11, 1, 1, E1. This is the 1, 1 component, right? 1, 1. Plus 2 times E2, 1, E1. Plus 3 times E3, 1, E1. Etc. Okay, it's a sum sign. And so on. I can put all of the components. So now I'm expressing the whole tensor in terms of the components that originally constitute the matrix. Okay? So that's the full tensor. I just wrote it explicitly by using that expression. The components come from that. No question. Any questions so far? Yes. I think not. Okay, I just modified it to five. I hope that it's that you can you won't be able to find. And is it necessary when I change an arbitrary number of? You you might get lucky and do find such two vectors again that are not like this that still give you all of these components but not that one. But notice that here there are nine equalities, whereas you have six degrees of freedom, so it's very easy to destroy such a equality. Okay, in three D. Okay. Uh, so, but let's concentrate on what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, so, this is how uh, the tensor looks like. So now I can put this picture in a slightly different way. I'm going to write the matrix A as follows. So it's one times. So now I'm talking about the matrix. So this is the component one, and it multiplies the one one component. So for me, the one one component is associated with the following basis member for the matrix, okay, if you like. So then the two component is one, zero, one, zero. And the third component would multiply zero, zero, one, and so on, okay. So, in some sense, if you like, the matrix expression for the basis is now the basis for the tensor is, in terms of components, a 
matrix itself. Just like this, what when I see it in a very simple setting, I would understand, for instance, that vector to be 1, 0, 0, and this one would be 0, 1, 0, etc. Right? So there will, as, uh, in total, be nine such matrices, each having only one in its appropriate uh, position. And therefore, these nine matrices with only one uh, at an appropriate location and zero everywhere else constitutes a basis for all possible three by three matrices. Okay? But that's component form thinking. We don't want to think that way. We want to think always in terms of tensors. And this is the expression from now on. Without explicitly writing anything out, uh, this is the expression that we will be thinking in terms of. Okay. So that is pretty much a review of um, last time. Any questions about that part? Okay. All right. So now let me, uh, before I move on with a few more specific examples, uh, let me just uh, show an equivalent expression for the following. If A is A i e i, then the way I found AI, because I have an orthonormal basis, is simply A dotted with EI, right? We have shown that. Now, suppose I would like to find if the tensor is AIJ, EI bon EJ, what I would like to find is AIJ. Okay. And the question is, how do I do that? And the answer is quite simple, actually. It's simply EI dot A. EJ. Okay. Normally, a tensor, it's, you can be uh, provided the tensor in a form that is not explicit in terms of the uh, members or the components with respect to the spaces. And therefore, you would like to find that. This is how you would find it. Okay. And in this way, if you choose some basis that is not conventional, that in terms of orientation, let's say, you can still find the components of the tensor with respect to that basis and make use of them if necessary. Just like normally, you have a vector and sometimes the need arises to find the components with respect to a different basis and that's how you find it. But So we've shown that, remember, and I'm going to now quickly show you this as well. And the fact that we have an orthonormal basis simplifies things uh, again. So how do I find it? Well, I want to actually just verify the expression and therefore what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in the expression for A. Okay, so let me choose indices M and N. So that is the general expression for the tensor. Why don't you not write for a second and then you can continue. Okay. So that's the expression, right? And now the result is A M N E I dot. Okay. So now I have a tensor operating on A vector. And how do I know what to do? The rule is here. The rule tells me what to do. I cannot make it up. The rule tells me what to do. And the rule tells me that what I should do is I should take the inner product of the neighboring vectors and leave the last one by itself. And now this is the Kronecker delta, delta and j. And now I have A, M, N. Let me just keep everything as it is without doing substitution yet. Notice that there's a dot product still. The free vector is over there, E, I, dot, E, M. And that itself is another Kronecker delta, delta, I, M. Okay? Now you can proceed in any way you like. I see a N and a N. I cancel that, put the J in there. I see a M and a M. I cancel this M and put the I in there. So I'm doing substitution property at the same time. It doesn't matter where, where, whether there are, there's one or more than one Kronecker delta. You can always carry out with the substitution part, property without any doubt. And the result is AIJ, as I wanted to show. Okay. So that's how you, and we're going to need this uh, identity as well um, soon. Okay. So please go ahead and write. And just for reference, I'm going to write down here for you to see the rule of how 
a second order tensor operates on a vector. Yes. Does the orientation matter with this uh, formula? With this formula? Um, where do you want to take C? To the left. You want to take to the C to the left, right. Okay, that's a fair question. So can I define the, um, the operation such that I can operate on a vector not always from, so this is of the form, AC gives me a result. Can I define an operation CA equals something? In principle, you can, uh, but I'm not going to do that. Some things are just a matter. So in principle, you can. And what matters, what you should keep in mind is you can always define something and attach a meaning to it. And as long as you use it consistently, and that's particularly true in the context of this course, it's OK. And some people attach different meanings to similar objects that we will uh, see. Uh, but I won't do it. And that's why it's important also to stick to my notation, because there really are several uh, notations out there. Um, all right. Now, I'm going to give you a, um, a few examples to tensors. But before I do that, at this point, you might immediately ask, well, we talked about a second order tensor. That's a second order tensor, a very particular one. And that's a general one. And that's a vector. We could call the first order tensor, but we're not going to. Okay? It's just a vector, and I understand uh, what I understand from it. Now, what's a third order or a fourth order tensor? Now, the thing is, uh, with this operation of a bond, you can arbitrarily build, actually, tensors of pretty much any order. And I'm going to build a tensor of fourth order. Okay? And I'm going to take two tensors, A, A, I, J, E, I, bond, E, J. And B, B, M, N, E, M, bond, E, N. And now what I can do is I can take the bond of these two tensors. And this is second order. This is second order. The result is fourth order. Okay, You pretty much always sum the orders, right? One, one gives you two. So that's another tensor. So we will. Um, uh, in only one case, encounter uh, such a fourth order tensor uh, when we deal with this first special topic of elasticity, linear elasticity. Uh, but apart from that, we're not going to uh, encounter such tensors presently. Um, now, on the other hand, um, you should immediately realize this, that just like this is a very particular tensor, and not all second order tensors look like this, this is also a very particular fourth order tensor. One, such that its components, and now there are four indices, okay? um, it's equal to A, I, J, B, K, L. But in general, the, a fourth order tensor does not have to be expressed in terms of two second order tensors. So a general expression would be simply C, I, J, K, L, multiplying the basis. And what's the basis? That's the basis. Okay. Notice if i goes from 1 to 3, the dimension of the space is 3. When I do bonds, it's not like I'm increasing the dimension. It's just that the object, uh, in terms of its meaning, gets sort of more general. Okay? So that would be a fourth order um, tensor. So once or twice, we will see encounter such an um, object. Um, also, notice that um, just another remark that just um, complements um, the a previous question. There are very different notations out there. Some people like to indicate the order of a tensor with the number of lines that go with it. So for instance, this is a vector. If I want to look at a second order tensor, 
they say, okay, I don't know if you mean with the capital a vector, a tensor, or whatever. I want to immediately express what I mean by it by putting two lines underneath. And if it's a fourth order tensor, they would put uh, four lines underneath. And the object sort of writing-wise gets heavy in my opinion, but that's, you know, that's their way of uh, notation. Okay. So let's put that to one side. Okay. And let me talk about some particular tensors. And in particular, a useful one is the identity tensor. What does the identity tensor look like? In terms of the matrix, I know what it looks like, right? So I, one, 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 and everything else is zero. So um, you can probably already guess what this thing is going to be. The components are such that it's equal to one if it's on the diagonal, if the indices are the same and zero otherwise. So it's like a Kronecker delta. So it's going to be delta ij ei bond ej. Okay? But now you can also do the substitution property. And of course, we realize all the components multiplying everything other than the diagonal are zero. So you only have a sum over the diagonal components and the basis associated with that. So it's only e1 bun E1 plus, E2 bun E2 plus, the components are 1, E3 bun E3. So it's EI bun EI, and which we already see from this substitution property. Okay? Uh, let me go ahead and um, prove that. Right. So let's check. And the check is that when I operate on a vector, I expect the vector to come out by itself, right? That's the definition of an identity tensor. Uh, let me check if that is indeed so. So I'm going to work on the left-hand side. I'm going to plug in the expression for i. Let me put in this one, ei bun ei. And I'm going to throw in an expression for a. Again, always careful with the indices at this stage. Everything is repeated at most twice to indicate summation. If I have four i's floating here, things will get messed up. You might still end up with the correct answer in particular cases when you do a mistake with the indices. What's important to realize is that you are lucky, right? In general, you won't. Okay? So you have to be very careful with the indices. All right. So now um, this is equal to, right, aj. Now I'm going to speed up things a little bit, right? I'm not going to write down every time. That's a scalar. I took it outside. I have a tensor operating on a vector. The rule tells me dot the inner ones leave the outer one by itself. So, and when I dot the inner ones, it's ei dot ej, delta ij, leaving ei by itself. Right? I took two steps inwards. Right? And then I can go ahead and do the substitution property on j. And so I have ai ei. And ai ei is nothing but the vector itself. Okay? That was just a check of um, consistency. Now let me erase this here for a second. I want to give another example. Um, so now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to also relate these, con um, these objects to things and operations that we already know about. So for instance, another operation we know about, since this is somehow associated with matrices and this is with the arrays or vectors, if you like, um, then we expect, or we understand that the outcome of that operation should be a standard matrix vector multiplication, a standard matrix vector, or in my words, array multiplication would be in terms of notation like this, and a simple index notation expression exercise would tell you that the component bi is equal to a i j a j. This has got nothing to do with, at this stage, tensor calculus. Matrix times a vector gives you a vector, components, and in terms of summation convention, that's how you would express it. You could have shown this after the first lecture. All right. So now what I want to show is that this notation, the tensor notation, sort of will deliver you a result that looks like that. Okay. So that's our expectation. So let's check okay, if the result is indeed um, the same. 
right? So again, don't write just for a second and have a look. So again, always if you want to verify something like this, you go ahead and plug in the expression for A and all the other vectors. So just be careful with the indices. E, K. I'm not doing anything for the right hand side. The right hand side is going to be equal to something, a vector B. We'll see what it looks like. So now that is equal to. So let me proceed like this. That's what I like to show. A i j, right? A k. This operates on a vector. So okay, here I'll write it once again explicitly. E j dot e k. The inner ones are dotted. The outer one is left by itself. This is delta j k. I can go ahead and use the substitution property on any one of these. I'm going to go ahead with k. Okay? So this result is equal to, right? this here is equal to a i j small a j e i. And now, there's a summation over j, so this object has only one free index. Let me call it b i. b i a i is a vector b, right, as I wanted to show. Okay. And the outcome is consistent with my expectation. Okay. If I had defined things, let's say the how a tensor operates on a vector slightly differently, the outcome could have been different. It's not. I defined it in such a way that it is consistent with this outcome. Okay, so now I'm moving to a um, new example. And here, again, I'd like to check something. It's consistency with uh, what we understand from a matrix matrix product, right? I want two tensors next to one another equaling a ne another tensor, second order, second order, second order, right? That's feasible, meaningful. Two, let's say three by three matrices will give me a three by three matrix. And you have already shown, as soon as we were talking about the um, summation convention, this is an example that I had given and that you had thought about in class. Okay, that's the result that we, that we expect. So now I'd like to verify that, right? So let me check once again. Okay, so what do I do? Well, I want to calculate A, operate A times, let's say B, uh, and see what it looks like. And this is a tensor C in terms of components C, I, J, E, I, bon, E, J. Okay. So I want to find out what C, I, J looks like. So I throw in A. And I throw in B. Oh, let me call it K, L, E, K, bon, E, L. And the result is A, I, J, B, K, L, this times that. But what is that? I know how to operate with a tensor on a vector, but operation of a tensor on a tensor is something that we have not defined yet. So I'm all of a sudden stuck. So now, there are two ways to go about it. Uh, actually, there is only one way to go about it, but eventually we will find out a second way to go about it, which will be a, introducing an understanding of what a tensor multiplying a tensor means. 
I will write down what it, mean, what it is shortly. But before that, I need to think about what to do. Well, what I need to do is I need to think about the meaning of an operator. An operator, as I just told you, is defined by the way it acts on a vector. And I know how a second order tensor acts on a vector. So I'm going to throw in a vector in here. What is the vector? It could be anything. I'm going to call it, uh, let's call it small c. Okay? So that should be equal to, since this whole thing is equal to capital C, the tensor, okay? A, B multiplying C should be equal to C multiplying the vector C, right? So the right-hand side is equal to C, I, J, okay? Um, e, I, bond, E, J, operating on the vector C, K, E, K, okay? Let me first work out the right-hand side, right? So that's equal to um, C i j small c j e i. Why did I not work it out in detail? Because we just derived this expression. If a tensor acts on a vector, the components are i j j e i. This is just what I worked out. Okay, the right hand side is taken care of. So now I work with the left hand side, and I do it in steps, right? A, B operating on C is, by the meaning of uh, these operations, first B operating on C, and then on this result, it's a vector, A will operate. So first I will take care of that part, right? It's B, K, L operating on the vector C. Again, I apply the rule that I know. So that is equal to B, K, L, C, L, E, K. Any objection to that? I just drive the result. I'm making use of it. OK. So now, this is a vector. Let me introduce different colors to understand the stages. This is a new vector. Let me just call it D. OK, so BC is equal to a vector D. And D has components DK basis EK. All right. So now, a vector A operates on a, a tensor A operates on a vector D. And the outcome is A, I, J, D, J, E, J. Sorry, E, I. Do we agree? Okay. I'm doing it in such a way that all you see is tensor vector multiplication. Tensor vector, C, I, J, C, J. Tensor vector, B, K, L, C, L. Tensor vector. AIJ, DJ. Okay, I'm applying always the same rule. Okay, so now I'm going to throw in now what I just derived here in blue, the meaning of D. DJ is B. Now the free index is J, the free index is K. I need to be careful. So I'm going to re express it in terms of my choice of free index, which is J. So it is BJ, any third choice of index, in this case L. A repeated index, dummy index, C, L. Okay? And hence, this is equal to okay, A, I, J, B, J, L, C, L, E, I. Okay, so far? Anything that puzzles you so far? All I've done is matrix vector, tensor vector multiplication, and at some point I resubstituted the meaning of D into that expression and put everything together. There is the left hand side, there is the right hand side. Okay. So now I want to find out what Cij looks like. Okay. So I have an I and a J, okay, and eventually a basis I. This is good, right? So this whole thing must be equal to this whole thing. Do we agree? Right? Because the basis, they're, they're the same. Okay? So um, eventually here I have a J and an L and a CL. Here I have a CJ. What I'm going to do is, since this is a dummy index, I'm going to go ahead and call this something else. Instead of J, 
I'm going to call it L to make things look entirely similar. So now the left sign is equal to right hand side. There is a CL here and a CL there, right? So this part that multiplies CL should be the same, right? So I'm combining now this with that. What I'm saying is I have A, I, J, B, J, C, B, J, L, C, L equals C, I, L, C, L. And C is any vector, absolutely any vector. So it doesn't matter what it is. So this part must be equal to that part. And the conclusion is, is A, I, J, B, J, L is equal to C, I, L. So the components are multiplied. There is a summation over the inner index. The outer indices are free indices. Exactly the same thing here. Summation over the inner indices, outer indices are inner in, uh, free indices. So that is what I wanted to show, and that is what I get. Okay. Why don't you write that much? So after this lecture, I'm going to assign you a homework number one, and soon after that, homework number two. And you already see that indices are floating around, right? Uh, tons of them. We change them when necessary to reach the conclusion I desire. So we have to be comfortable with these operations. And imagine now if we didn't have the summation convention and we had to also write down all the summation signs, uh, that would be really a burden. And, uh, so the summation convention makes really everything very compact. As you write, or if, you've, if you're done, feel free to ask a question about what I've just done. Right? So in all of that, those, those transitions I repeatedly used. That result that I just dried in the previous board. Right, I did it three times. The trick was to throw in a vector because I don't know how a tensor operates on a tensor. I know how a tensor operates on a vector. I threw in a random vector C. It doesn't matter what it is. And because it really doesn't matter what it is, I concluded that the things that multiply CL on the left and right hand sides have to be the same. Okay. Yes? The whole thing. This one. OK, so there I took some steps that quickened my uh, transitions, right? So when I look at this, I see a vector. Okay, so the transition is green, so I'll write it in green. I see a vector A operating on a vector D is going to be equal to something. Yes, I did have an EK and a DK, etc., but I already know what the outcome is supposed to be. The outcome is, right, if AD is equal to a vector, that vector has components A, I, J, DJ, EI. I immediately wrote that. If you want, what you can do is you can go ahead and operate with this on that. It will give you a delta JK multiplying EI, etc. Okay. But since I already know what the result is supposed to be, I immediately wrote it down. Okay. This you are always allowed to do. Once you know what the result is, you don't have to go through the same sort of procedure again and again and again. You can fast forward towards the solution. Another question? Now, this is sort of cumbersome. It's something that we're going to have to do once in a while. So why don't we realize a new rule so that if I have to operate with a tensor or another tensor, I don't have to every time throw in some random vector to figure out what is going on. So I'm going to introduce a rule that is not a definition, actually. It is a result that comes out of this transition from this sort of these are these calculations, right? So I'm not redefining something. 
we just realize that. So I'm going to write here, not new. Okay. We just realize that if I see two tensors okay, of this special form, which could be bases, E, I, E, J, E, K, E, L, whatever, or they could be any vector. What I understand from this is you take the inner two vectors and dot them, you bond the outer two. So the result is B dot C multiplying A bond D. Okay. This comes out of that calculation. It is consistent with what I observe in that calculation. Okay. Let me just check for you that it is indeed that way. Um, so I had A bond B. Okay. So I'm going to now, instead of going through that calculation one, I, I won't do it again, of course. I'm going to apply this rule, see if the result is consistent with what I got there. And you will see that it makes our life simpler. So I'm going to throw in A. and B, okay? And now I apply this new rule. And the rule tells me, well, the components stay where they are. You dot the inner two, and you bond the outer two, okay? This is delta J K. I see a K here, there is also a K there. So I can plug in J in there. And therefore the result is A I J B J L E I bond E L. Which is precisely what we have on the other board. Right? It was indeed quicker, right? So uh, that's the purpose. So this is also something, if you wish, you can remember. Again, you should, I highlight that, the definition that is the basis of everything we're doing is this. This must be defined. Okay? This is a definition. This is just a convention, a rule that we understand from operations based on this definition. Um, there are a number of other operations eventually that um, you will come about and will have to use. At this point, I have not defined what transposes yet. In fact, that is my immediate next goal. I will define you what a transpose is. But you all know what a transpose is, right? You switch rows and columns of a matrix. So if I had an operation transpose of a tensor with transpose of uh, A multiplying um, B, and that's a tensor C, I may also be interested in the components of C, I, J. If there is no transpose, it's equal to A, I, K, B, K, J. But if there is a transpose, something must change. Or I might be interested in A, B transpose, and that is some other tensor D. What is D, I, J equal to? Now it turns out that the expressions, as you will show in the homework, and you can show these based on that rule. You don't have to throw in a vector, but it's your choice in the end. The result is A, K, I, B, K, J. And this result is A, I, K, B, J, K. Okay. Versus... Um, that's homework, right? These two are homework. Uh, but let me tell you how to remember these. Because it's something we're going to use a lot. This one, for sure, after a few homework problems, you're going to, it's going to be embedded in your mind. OK, I have two matrices. The summation index is in the middle. If there's a transpose on the left-hand side, the summation index is on the left. 
If there is a transpose sign on the right, the summation sign is on the right. That's a very simple way to remember the outcome, right? No transpose, it's in the middle. Transpose on the left, it's on the left. Transpose on the right, it's on the right, okay? This one, again, if you like, um, if it remains in your mind after a few problems, then you are free to always use it um, at your will. Now, um, I did already write down what the, 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 the transpose. Uh, so, of course, you cannot show this yet. You can write these parts from what you understand from a matrix matrix multiplication and understand this to be the transpose of A. But um, in terms of a tensor notation, what does tensor A transpose mean? Let us discuss that now. So I want to talk about transpose and eventually symmetry. And notice that everything here is um, topic-wise is following a natural order. So step by step, one concept leads us immediately to a, another concept. Okay. Um, so I will first begin with what is called a component or a extrinsic representation. And I'll begin with an example, like I sometimes do, to relate to uh, what you already know from your undergrad linear algebra. So I will take a 2 by 2 matrix, and the matrix is 1, 3, 1, 2. And now I'd like to take the transpose of this matrix. Okay? Now, there is a notation that I like to use. Um, this is the transpose of matrix A versus, slight play with words, this is the components of the transpose of the matrix. They are, of course, the same thing, but the word-wise is different. Transpose of matrix A, the components of the transpose of A. Tensor notation-wise, this tiny difference for me is sometimes important. So that, of course, is nothing New is just you switch rows and columns. So we understand what a um, what it is in terms of matrices. So if I wanted to indicate, so the reason I introduced this here is sometimes I like to refer to the components of the transpose. And I will refer to it like this the component ij of A transpose, okay? Which is equal to? AJ. AJI, okay. Right. So that is a extrinsic representation. Now I will tell you or give you a implicit, I'm sorry, intrinsic representation of or definition of a transpose and it is the following. And this is the first time we are seeing this expression intrinsic. One might have different words and different references, but the idea is the following. A extrinsic represent a component representation refers to the components with respect to a basis. In order to work with it and understand what it is, you have to explicitly calculate the components. An intrinsic representation or in an intrinsic representation, you never see a basis. The basis could be anything. In fact, the basis doesn't need to be even orthonormal. It could be any basis of your choice. And this definition always holds. Right? And this is our understanding of a transpose. So it's such that the transpose, so we, we obtain two things from this box, actually. One, the definition of a transpose, that's how it is defined, such that this equality holds. But two, we gain something very nice. If I have such an expression, and I would like to take this tensor from the right-hand side of the dot product to the left-hand side, the definition of the transpose tells me that 
instead of A, you put an A transpose, and the equality still holds. So it allows me to move the tensor from one side to the other. That's a very nice capability that we will make use of. Okay. Um, so along with this definition, of course, immediately comes the definition of symmetry. If A transpose is equal to A, then I am looking at a symmetric tensor. Okay. So at this stage, let me just write the components of A transpose I know are, are A, J, I. So if this is a tensor B, this is Bij. That's this is in order to, in order to not to have to do this, I introduce this notation. So A transpose Ij refers to the components Ij of this tensor B, which is A transpose. So Ij Ij, right? Notice that there is a transpose there. But A transpose Ij is Aji. So the base is still Ij. Ji, Ij. No error there. And if it is equal to the right hand side, then Aji must be equal to Aij. And that's how you can, in one way, conclude that uh, result. Of course, that's something you can also show from this, or you can show. Um, you should be able to show from the intrinsic definition, and you will do that again in the homework. Um, this comes with a caveat, a, in other words, a word of caution. Okay? At this point, I'm just put an exclamation mark there. The components of the transpose of a tensor is not always calculated by taking the transpose of the matrix of the components, you have to take into account the basis. Okay, in other words, A transpose is not always equal to A, J, I, E, I, one, E, J. Okay? Um, and that complexity occurs when the tensor basis is such that on the left-hand side of the bond, I see one set of basis vectors. And on the right-hand side, I don't see the same set, but something else. Now, at this stage, it's these words are floating you know, just beyond your ears because you don't have a concrete example. But in just two or three weeks, you will see concretely what I mean by that. So that's why I put this exclamation mark. Okay. Um, there are a number of self-studies eventually that you will do again in the homework. So I'm, in order to give you room for practice, um, I will keep it in the homework. But let me write down some of the results here. Okay. If you have A bond B and if you want to take its transpose, the result is equal to B bond A. Okay. Um, right. And some, although there is a word of caution, some results that we have shown, A transpose A, J, I, E, I, E, J. And if you have A transpose operating on a vector A, the result is B and B is not A, I, J, A, J, because there is a transpose. It's rather A, J, I, B, J. Okay. So that's because it's A transpose, sorry. That's because there is a transpose there. Everything written in blue, you can easily verify yourself. Although everything is almost a definition there, any questions with what I've written? Yeah? When, when we take the transpose of a tensor, why do you write still uh, EI bond EJ? And 
Good. Actually, that's exactly the point. In general, that's that's an excellent question. So, in general, if I would like to, so if A is A I J E I bon E J, the um, let me say error-free approach would be to write A transpose would be A I J E J bon E I. This is your question, right? Why don't we do it? In fact, this is something that always works, irrespective of what you see on the left and right hand sides of bun. But when you see the same thing, it's equivalent to that. Okay, It's equivalent to that because the indices are dummy indices. Instead of i, I can write a j. Instead of j, I can write a i, i and I, can, I get that. So, so the trick is that if you see the same thing on both sides of the bun, that's the result. But if you don't, you can't do that. Okay. Okay, all right. So I'll give you exactly the example that is relevant to us. I will introduce a tensor F. And this tensor has a basis, a strange basis. The basis has, on the left hand side, has to do with one set of basis vectors. And on the right hand side, another set of basis vectors. There is a difference between the first and the second set. So I will choose a second set. As a with, diff with a different label. I will call it capital E. Now, capital E doesn't mean a tensor in this one exceptional case. There are a few exceptional cases where a small letter, uh, a lowercase, can mean a tensor and an uppercase can mean a vector. This is one instance. So it's uppercase. I will also pick the label to be uppercase, okay? just because I like to do so. Okay? Um, to understand that when I see this label, to understand that that label refers to not that, but that basis. Okay? Because labels themselves also indicate me something. I see an I, it refers to basis EI. I see an A, it refers to capital EA. Right? So, and then the components go like that, FIA. So that's a tensor as well, except that the basis is something that we have not encountered before, but we will very soon. Now, if you would like to calculate F transpose, the result is not FAI, because the matrix is such that the first index is always lowercase, the, upper, the second index is always uppercase. So F capital AI is something that just doesn't exist in my notation, and indeed, the definition of the transpose applies here, and that is the outcome. Okay? That's what I mean by when the first two vectors don't match. Okay. So it's not equal to F A I E I bond E A. Okay? There are several remarks to make here, okay? but it's not the time for it. But that's just one example since you asked for it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I've talked about the um, transpose, and uh, and I've talked about a symmetric tensor. What naturally comes next is a skew symmetric tensor. So sometimes, so sometimes A can equal its transpose, then a symmetric. Sometimes the transpose of the tensor is not equal to itself, but minus the tensor. That is called a skew symmetric tensor. Okay. So a skew symmetric tensor is such that its components read The transpose is not equal to itself, so not equal to Aij, but equals minus Aij. OK, so we are in a uh, three-dimensional space, right? Uh, I take a general tensor. How many independent components does it have? Nine. 
the tensor itself, nine. Okay. If it's symmetric, how many? Six. Six. If it's skew symmetric, how many? Three. <coughs> Three. Do you see that? Yes? What is A11? A22, two, two. object equals minus, right? A330. Three, three, so diagonal is zero, and the off diagonal components are minus one another. So there are only three independent components. So, in that sense, if you like, it's, a, it's like it's a tensor, but it has three independent components. So, in some sense, it's like a vector. And indeed, we will associate it with a vector in uh, maybe in the next lecture. Um, all right. So, um, zero diagonal components. So it has three independent components. Now, um, since we talked about symmetric and skew symmetric tensors, it turns out that for any tensor, you can introduce its, you can define a symmetric and a skew symmetric part. And I'm going to indicate those like this. So I take a tensor A, and I would like to define its so-called symmetric part. And it's like this, A plus A transpose. And I can also define its so-called skew symmetric part. It's 1 half A minus A transpose. So the tensor itself is any tensor, not symmetric, not skew. But if you calculate the symmetric part, this quantity, you can take the transpose of this, in other words, transpose of asymmetric, and it's equal to itself. Okay? This is a symmetric composition. And this, likewise, if you take the transpose of this, it's minus itself, and therefore it's called the skew symmetric part. Now, if you sum them, a, a, one half, so they can, it's, it's a, a alone, and a transpose minus, they cancel. So A is the sum of its symmetric and skew symmetric parts. In some sense, these are the, it splits them into two independent parts. Nine independent components, six independent components, three independent components, six, three, nine. So we do have some more time remaining. And therefore, what I will do is I will actually introduce some concepts. And perhaps we'll have a chance to introduce, I'm sorry, discuss them in a little bit more detail next time. Um, and these are the so-called invariants. So now that I have also transpose at my, uh, at my hands for possible use, and I needed it, I can move to the next step. Okay? So now we're going to define some numbers that are associated with tensors. And it's important to realize that in this case, I'm dealing with any tensor A. Um, we are interested in those that are associated eventually operating on the three-dimensional vectors as we know, three-dimensional vector space. And um, in that space, we will define eventually three numbers. And these numbers are called invariants. And I will tell you why they are called invariants. Um, so perhaps we start by choosing a basis, okay? Or in fact, it's not even a, we could be a basis. We're going to choose any uh, set of linearly independent vectors. So a, a, a set of three linearly independent vectors, any one, 
as long as they are linearly independent. Of course, by definition, we're in the three-dimensional space, so they do constitute actually a basis. It doesn't need to be the basis that I like. They don't even have to be orthonormal, but they are linearly independent. And I will call them A, B, C. Okay. Um, it's any choice, right? And now I will define three numbers. So now it takes a little bit of right writing. Um, so let me first write these down. So I'm defining the so-called invariants. The invariant associated with A, the first one, the second one, the third one. Okay. Uh, in every expression, there is a numerator and a denominator, and A, B, C as a triple product appears in every one of them. Remember the triple product, right? A dot B cross C. Okay, that's the definition. What if it's equal to zero? Huh? Yes, and hence, they are linearly independent. It cannot be equal to zero. So I can divide by that triple product, okay? I'm not doing something ill-defined. Um, and on the remaining portions, I will write different expressions. Uh, there is actually even a way you can memorize this. In all ones, you, are, you have a division by A, B, C. Uh, in the third one, there is only one possible way. So you're talking about the third invariant. The A has to appear three times, and there is only pretty much one way it can appear if you allow only uh, one A to appear per vector. So A, 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 B, A, C. In this one, there are multiple ways. So I, I'm going to throw in two A's because it's this second invariant. So this, of course, is not, I'm, I'm sort of giving you a reasoning behind or, or a way to remember the invariants. Uh, I ha they have to appear twice. It's the second invariant. So it could be A, 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 B, already twice appeared. So C appears by itself. But I also could have written A, A, B by itself. And it could act on C. Or I could have A by itself, A, B, AC. So that is the second invariant. And the first invariant is where on, within the triple product A appears only once. So it could be A, A, B, C, and so on. That is the, those are the definitions for the three invariants. Now, I am in three dimensions, okay? So that's why I'm writing three invariants. So these definitions are strictly for uh, three dimensions. If you're in two dimensions, you can still calculate, let's say, the determinant and the, uh, sorry, the third invariant and the first one, if you like. For instance, you can attach a meaning to them, but this is for 3D. Three different numbers. Oh, there are. Yes, there are. Uh, so, so, so you're talking. So, he, he, the question was: Is are there is there any relation between principal stresses and these numbers? Uh, so, first of all, he's referring to a particular tensor, which is stress. And when he says principal stresses, he's referring to its eigenvalues. All of these things are things we have not yet uh, introduced. Uh, but the invariants can be expressed in terms of eigenvalues. So, but first, I have to introduce the concept of an eigenvalue, which we're going to do uh, next lecture. Okay? The answer is yes. So let me quickly tell you what they are and why they are called invariants. The reason they are called invariants is very simple. There was an arbitrary choice of three vectors. So you can choose one set, you can choose another set, he can choose another set, and she can choose yet another one. The tensor is always the same tensor. And its components, of course, will change depending on which basis you have individually chosen. So if you calculate the components of A for your own basis in matrix form, they will all look different. Do we understand that? Right? That's what vectors are also the same. They depend on the choice of the basis in terms of their components. But 
when you calculate these numbers for your own choice of the three vectors, everybody will tell me the same number. Okay? The tensor is the same, irrespective of the choice of these three vectors. I1, the second one, and third invariants will come out to be the same. Invariant, by the word, means something that doesn't change. Doesn't change with respect to the choice of these three vectors. Okay? So now, what do these mean, or do I know what they mean um, from my earlier linear algebra knowledge? The third one happens to be equal to the determinant. And sometimes I will write it like this. Okay? In fact, very often I will write it like this, because this is a cumbersome notation. In fact, sometimes I will always, when possible, drop this bracket. At this stage, I introduce it. This is sometimes how I like to write it to make things clear. But determinant A. And I know how to calculate the determinant of a matrix. But the determinant of a tensor, okay, uh, that's how it's calculated, if you like. Um, so that's determinant. Now, without verification, it turns out that there is a very elegant expression for what this, things look, things, what this thing looks like in terms of the components of A. So when you calculate the determinant, remember there are some operations. You calculate cofactor, minor matrices, whatever, multiply with uh, components of A plus minus signs float around. When you do those operations, it's equivalent to this compact set of expressions or e calculations that are implied by this compact expression. It's precisely equivalent to what you would normally do to calculate a determinant. EIJK, permutation simple, AI1, AJ2, AK3. So the third one is an invariant. The first one is also going to appear a lot, and I'm going to indicate it like this. It is the trace. Does anyone remember what the trace of a matrix is? Exactly, some of the diagonal components. So it is indeed equal to AII. Um, you can verify these things by plugging in the expressions for ABC, actually. I'm just writing down what the results are without further manipulation. Okay? And finally, um, the second one is a little bit non-trivial. It has no name, okay? So as far as I know, second invariant. Um, and uh, if you work it out in terms of components, it's equal to 1 half AII squared minus a i j a j i okay and the first quantity that appears it's the trace of a squared so this is trace of a so when there is no ambiguity i drop the bracket to make the notation a bit compact trace of a squared right and this, it turns out, okay, is um, equal to, and I believe I'm, well, I'm sort of going to uh, verify it next time. Um, it's equal to trace of a squared. So here I put a squared in brackets so that there is no ambiguity as to whether I'm saying trace a squared or trace of a squared. I'm saying trace of a squared. So a squared is something you can calculate. You have the definition for a trace, so you can verify that actually this is equal to that. Okay. So actually, we are in good shape. It's a good point to stop. So next time, we're going to take off from here. I'm going to just remind you quickly what these are. And then we're going to move on to uh, new concepts. Okay. Yes? This one? The indices are all repeated, yes. They are dummy indices, so there's a sum of over them. You could have written KK, K, 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 L, L, whatever. What's, what's, what's the question? What, what's? Like, uh, for example, the I is repeated four times. Oh, right. Oh, I see. No, no. The repetition is, has to do with a product. So there is a repetition. I think I calculate this independently from that. The problem is if there was no minus sign there, 
then it would be problematic. I understand. Yes, this is okay. Exactly. Those terms individually can have multiple appearances of I. Yeah. Question? Okay, then. I'll see you next time.